So in the last lecture, we ended up talking about this notion of Euclidean distances as a notion of similarity. How do we define when something is close to another one? And this works perfectly fine as long as everything is very linear and we're really solving for linear subspaces. So the additional challenge we have when we have a problem that's more like the following one is that our normal notions of Euclidean distance start breaking down, or at least maybe not the most appropriate choice for somehow untangling and flattening out an S shape like this in two-dimensional space. And I want to flatten it out so that I can have the data represented in its true manifold form, which is uh, along this S curve that we can draw here. So this is sort of like the simplest version of a nonlinear dimensionality reduction problem that we need to be able to solve. Taking this two-dimensional XY coordinates um, of this S curve, flattening out and learning that these are actually connected in this way, and so that my uh, data can be more simply and straightforwardly represented as a line over there. So once again, our goal here is to to reduce, uh, like in dimensionality reduction, and uh, especially to be able to visualize our data so that we can gain intuition, uh, run additional models, um, and sometimes to be able to discover things and discover patterns in our data that we didn't know to be there before. Now, the trick here is that we've talked a lot about uh, defining distances, Euclidean distances. The trick here with nonlinear dimensionality reduction is that we can no longer be confined by this notion of Euclidean distance. So we can define similarity using fancier techniques um, that are still based on Euclidean distance, but are no longer um, simply Euclidean distance. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit in this short lecture about the um, the types of decisions that we have to make when we are going behind Euclidean distance. Euclidean distance is a thing that we compute. There's one definition, there's one right answer. As long as you have the x, y vectors that describe each of these data points, we can, we can compute the Euclidean distance. But if we go beyond that, if we define similarity beyond that, then we have some decisions to make. So here's a set of decisions that we have to make when we're going beyond Euclidean distance. So the first one is that if you just look at this S-curve here, you can kind of intuitively see that um, let's call you know, this data point right here, is pretty close to that one. So that still works, right? Like if you just compute the distance between them, Euclidean distance between them, it's still pretty small. But it's then connected in this way over here so that it's actually more connected to this data point than it is to this one, okay? Even though these two Euclidean distances, it's Euclidean closer to this point than it is to this point here, but if you just look at the S-curve, I think the right answer we're kind of looking for is that it should be closer to this point than it is to this point. When we flatten it out, we're, they're going to end up being uh, these points, respectively, or something like that. Okay? And so what we want to do is define some notion of similarity that has a concept of neighborliness. Like, the first decision we have to make is, uh, what is my neighbor? Like, how close do you have to be to be considered my neighbor? Okay? With regular Euclidean distance and PCA and linear techniques, uh, the distance is the only thing that determines my neighbor. But here I get to make a decision of what's my neighbor. How many neighbors do I have? Okay? This is starting to sound like some neighborhoods I've lived in. How many neighbors do I actually have? Is it just my close by neighbors? Or do I count the people who are a little bit uh, a few doors down? Right? If they're in the next block over, but my backyard is on their backyard, are they actually my neighbor? Because I don't actually know what their names are. But I know the people who live like four doors out from me because we share a road. Okay? <laughs> These are analogies that we can make. Um, the third decision we have to make is like how close do they have to be? How close are they really? Right? Maybe you share a lot with your next door neighbors because you actually share resources, maybe you have a, a common utility or sewage lines in common, so they're actually really close because they're really next to you. Well, because you don't share much with a neighbor that's one door down, even though they're practically as close to you as they are, then maybe they don't count as much, right? Basically, we then get to make decisions about what counts as similar and what are my neighbors in ways that, uh, um, that, that take into account more structure in the data set than are apparent by computing these Euclidean distances. Um, and then, the corollary of the set of decisions we have to make is that if I think my close by neighbors are somehow more important, like more and more important than my far away neighbors, how do I actually ignore these neighbors? Do I ignore 
far neighbors, right? Even though they're not that far away, what is a robust way that I can reason through this graph of this kind so that I end up being connected to these neighbors all on my road, but are not connected to this neighbor over here because they're on a different road, let's say. So these are the decisions that we need to be able to make. And as you can kind of see by using this kind of graphical analogy here and neighborliness analogies here, there is no one way of doing this. There is one definition of Euclidean distance in XYZ space, XYZ whatever, how interdimensional space, but there is no one right way of making these decisions about who's my neighbor, how many neighbors there are. And that's why there's actually a giant pile of really successful and commonly used algorithms and approaches for doing nonlinear dimensionality reduction and manifold learning. What's coming up next is that we're going to go through just a couple of what I consider to be the most instructional as well as the most popular ones that I've seen used um, by folks in engineering, in science, in data visualization, because I think it'd be really nice for you to not only um, know what they are and to have a, have, a, have a name recognition, but know just a little bit about how they're making these decisions and what are the trade-offs um, and why, why you might pick one over the other. There's a lot of depth here uh, because each of these algorithms actually have, um, have a lot of theoretical and statistical foundations. We're not going to go over that yet. That's going to be a later lecture in more advanced materials. Each of them are also algorithmically super interesting um, because if you're dealing with lots of data sets, really big data sets, and it takes hours and hours and days to crunch through them, it actually kind of matters how you implement the algorithms. Um, we're gonna not we're gonna talk a little bit about that right now um, in these foundation lectures, but we're not gonna go into depth um, until the more advanced materials. What we're really focusing on in these sets of lectures is the introduction and the intuition. So I'm trying to cast everything in this context of defining similarities so that you can tie the intuition behind these nonlinear techniques to your intuitions about similarity and distance in the linear techniques like PCA and SVD. And we're going to talk a little bit about the known trade-offs and pros and cons of them so that you can actually make an informed decision about how to use one if you're faced with a large data set and you might actually want to use nonlinear dimensionality reduction in order to plot it. So that's up next.